Hello and welcome, everybody. We are going rapid fire this afternoon to make this Ooh. thing happen. Uh, but we are joined today and right now with uh, by Dr. Eric Rasmussen. Thank you for being here. Uh, he is going to be sharing some updates from the field about how governments and organizations are responding to this pandemic. Uh, he is a board certified internal medicine physician and has been for roughly 30 years. After Stanford Medical School, he entered the U.S. Navy and was deployed to Bosnia three times, Afghanistan twice, and Iraq for eight months at the onset of that war. He later became both fleet surgeon for the U.S. Navy's third fleet and the chairman of an academic department of medicine in Seattle, where he's at today. Uh, he also spent nine years as a principal investigator with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, before retiring from the Navy and becoming the founding CEO of the TED Prize Award, uh, awarded to Larry Brilliant at Google.org to improve global infectious disease outbreak detection. He now leads an international disaster response team for the Roddenberry Foundation, um, which is supported by the Star Trek franchise and is the CEO of IHS, a multinational consulting group specializing in humanitarian sciences. With that, welcome, Eric. Let me get your slides up. Oh, outstanding. Thank you very much. And it's very good to be here. Hello, everybody. I see some people uh, tagging in on chat. It's nice to see you guys as well. Um, and I'm glad to be here. We wait for some slides because we're going to talk about some cool stuff. But I did just watch Peter, and Peter was fantastic. Uh, I, he and I do not have much overlap, but God, he is fun to listen to. I agree. I agree. And as per usual, you know, there's some hiccups here. So if there's anything you want to get started with while I get these loaded, feel free to go for it. Uh, not a lot, but we'll we'll chat for a moment because the thing that I'm doing today is kind of catching everybody up on things that are in the news all the time. And I hope that I'm going to find some fragments that are new for you. And I'm going to offer you some actual recommendations for things, which is a bit more than we would normally do. But there's a bunch of you that don't normally hear somebody like me who's working both research and field. So I might as well do what I can to give you the, uh, the useful information that's available to me. Some of it is directly related to me, and I will tell you about that. Most of it is not directly related to me. Um, and some of it I hope you will have heard a little bit over the previous couple of days. Now, I have every intention of looking at some slides here in a moment um, because there's stuff that I want to show you. Um, but if it doesn't show up, it doesn't show up. It should be there now. Can you see that, Eric? I cannot. I've got a little, uh, little spinning wheel. Oh, but no. But frankly, I don't care. Uh, what I can do is come over and bring up my own slides because sometimes the tech is what it is and I'm not willing to let that disturb us. So um, I think that right now I have a slide up that says in a very strange colored template, but it's, it's kind of grown on me, um, how governments and organizations are responding with a few alternatives suggested. Is that what's on your screen? Yep, we are on the same page. Then I can't see that at all, and I don't care. I'm going to run my own. Let's go to the next slide, please. Awesome. You got it. So part of what we're recognizing is that I'm coming very late to this particular game. You have had a couple of days at a bunch of very, very bright people who have told you many, many good things, and you're incredibly well informed now. You were bright to begin with, and you had a gravitation toward this event. So um, I'm going to bring some things to you that maybe can be synthesized in ways that are helpful for you. And it'll be unique, maybe, from that perspective. Um, next, let's get the first bullet up there. You know that China um, has gotten what's happened with coronavirus that I'm in Hubei province, in Wuhan city, and in the rest of China under control. But they did it at a phenomenally large cost to the you know one, two, maybe two and a half percent of their GDP. They succeeded, but it really has been costly. Next, um, Italy has tried to limit the economic impact. They only really lost about a day but an exponentials, even that day, turned out to be very consequential for them. Next, right now, at least eight counties in California, seven of them in the Bay Area, one down in Orange County, um, are under lockdown. That's a remarkable event and hasn't been seen for 100 years. Um, they're sheltering in place. These are things we usually talk about with tornadoes, and maybe there's some analogy there. Next, 
You heard Daniel summarize the state of the global response on Monday, Daniel Kraft. Um, in that intervening 48 hours, a ton of stuff has happened. I'll bring you a little bit up to date on some of it. Next. We're all learning a lot about exponentials. This is a singularity event. We talk a lot about exponentials here, but we have an awful lot of people who do not normally hang around singularity, don't know all that much about exponentials, but you're watching what that curve does. Next. We're also learning that it is possible to rise to the occasion to do very, very well under stressful circumstances, and that by and large, beha people behave well to each other when we're sh facing a common enemy. And we are. Down at the bottom, you'll see the four now famous um, Washington Post um, assessments of what happens with various kinds of protection, various kinds of shelter in place or self-quarantining or whatever, making sure that the distancing is from not at all too extreme. And those numbers look really good. The graph is very impressive. Next, please. Here's a black and white slide, um, dull as dirt. Um, that says a few things about what we know have been done that's really out of the ordinary. There are some, not all, but there are some Muslim countries that have chosen to stop Friday prayer gatherings. They are finding other ways to do it online and they are finding other ways that are satisfying for them, but that's a remarkable statement. Next, oral arguments have stopped, sorry, go back to stay on this, this slide for the moment. Um, oral arguments have stopped at the US Supreme Court. Um, hasn't happened since the influenza epidemic of 1918. The Small Business Administration is treating this like a disaster and offering small businesses disaster loans. And now, maybe, we're going to have the first really large-scale effort at universal basic income. As of about two hours ago, we're looking at a treasury in the United States issuing multiple hundreds to low thousands of dollars checks twice in the course of April and May to families and to businesses in the United States. That's gonna be an interesting test. Um, I work a lot in the Marshall Islands. Um, the Marshall Islands are pretty remote, although quite beloved, fly specks, middle of nowhere, and they have implemented quarantine. Um, they're a fragile place, and it's just one indication of the kind of things that the, the planet is worried about. Amazon, right here in Seattle. Um, I'm sitting maybe 10 miles from Amazon's headquarters, and I heard yesterday that they're now hiring 100,000 new people to handle the things that you and I are doing so that we don't go outside. Um, that's remarkable. Unfortunately, here in downtown Seattle, Amazon has had at least two buildings with positive coronavirus patients that have stopped. Um, their services, and that is causing a ripple effect among the businesses that support those buildings that is devastating to those businesses. Um, as you know, Italy is under a, a huge amount of pressure um, to try to get this under control. And despite the quarantine, they're singing to each other on balconies. It's kind of wonderful. Iran, another place that is having terrible troubles, um, has now released 85,000 prisoners from prison that are known to be coronavirus free and have put them on temporary furloughs and have dug mass graves in a graveyard that are visible so large they're visible from satellite. And just to ensure that you all understand that civilization is truly collapsing, St. Patrick's Day parties in Ireland were canceled. Um, so fine. Um, that seems about as extreme as anything could be, but what else could be done? Next. Well, you've heard it before, um, not social distancing in that phrasing. Certainly, we absolutely need phys uh, physical separation, two meters. We all know that, six feet. Please do that. But the social distancing is the last thing we need, right? We need caring. We need support. We need empathy and compassion. We need companionship. Something like 28% of the homes in the United States are filled with one person or somebody who has no one else that they can go to. That's a remarkable number and it's lonely. So staying in touch is a good idea. You heard some of that just now from Peter. Peter did a wonderful job of describing some of what's available. Um, and we're finding that as Peter pointed out for the workplace, a lot of that is closeness is now virtual. Next please. This ought to be a panel, a gallery view on Zoom. Um, I am not a particularly religious person but I find that my community is coming together around church services of various kinds. And sure enough, last Sunday, we had a Zoom meeting 
for the church service. I'm sure that's happening all over the world, not just in my little neighborhood. We had 112 people in the Zoom gallery when ordinarily we have about 50. And we had everybody face to face, just like you see on this slide. Instead of seeing the back of someone's head or the side of their face as you would in a pew, you're really genuinely face to face. You're watching each other's expressions change. You see somebody react to a comment and it's fun. And by the way, after the speaker view, while the ministers were doing their thing, we went into gallery view and everybody took a moment, got their cup of coffee and began chatting with their coffee, just like they would in the normal service. Puzzle fanatics are getting together and doing puzzles together online. Beer brewers and musicians and single moms, musicians in particular, people are holding impromptu concerts with each other, playing music together over Zoom. I find that very cool. Um, and bring up that last one, national governments are beginning to use Zoom and things like Zoom to get committee meetings um, efficient, and to ensure that all of the paperwork that needs to be done gets done. Um, so we have a lot of capability, as I hope you got from Peter, that can allow us to do very good things and actually even more face-to-face -face than we might otherwise be. Next, homeschooling. Homeschooling has um, become something that households all across the world are doing in addition to working remotely from home to earn a living, in addition to being the parents that they need to be. Three separate tasks all happening in one relatively confined area. That's likely to make people a little tense. So I love what um, went up here in the COVID-19 rainbow schedule, particularly for those of us that have been parents. Um, my kids are old enough and gone. Um, down at the bottom, all kids go to bed at eight o'clock unless they did everything they were supposed to do today and they didn't fight, in which case they can go to bed at nine o'clock. I found that charming. Um, you've already heard about Khan Academy. I won't go any further in that. There are many other options, but Khan Academy is going out of their way to be very helpful during this quite awkward period. Next. Media outlets all over the world are talking about my alma mater, for example, Stanford being abandoned. There are 643 colleges and universities in the United States that are shut down. Um, most of them anticipate that being for the remainder of the school year. Um, as you saw from Peter, there's some very creative ways to pull off graduations like Minecraft, um, but there are all kinds of things that are changing that are likely to be permanent um, in education, in transportation, in employment and across society. Next, please. This ought to be a black screen um, with a curve that's very familiar to people that hang around at Singularity. Um, Adam, is that what we have? Um, just making sure, because I still have nothing on my screen. Yes, you're, we're still on the same page. Cool, thank you. Um, so here is that disruptive exponential curve is that um, bring that last bit on with the space bar if you could, that a lot of nations are now paying close attention to. Um, it's very interesting to recognize how much is being discovered by national governments as they find they're looking for tools to make things work for the people on the ground. That's particularly true for healthcare workers. Um, an awful lot of healthcare workers with unique expertise are either ill or self-quarantined for exposure, and people are now calling into them in various ways to ask advice on what to do. It's a kind of telemedicine. It's not particularly efficient. It's not particularly sophisticated. It is, however, very efficient. Next slide, please. Since the title of this talk is what governments and organizations are doing, um, here's a, an obvious list of things that have been done. Um, lockdowns, as we mentioned. The EU has decided that nobody can cross their borders for non-essential travel. There's no tourism, there's no visiting into the EU, the entire European Union for the next 30 days. Australia, on the other hand, has said nobody leaves the continent. Nobody is allowed to leave Australia in some important ways. Um, that's a remarkable decision. Here in Seattle, we have halfway houses. We've taken over motels, we're taking over ships, we're taking over other kinds of places, empty buildings at military bases where we can put people who are not sick but need to be quarantined so that they're not a burden 
on the healthcare uh, system, and they're not a burden to their families if their families are not infected. Uh, there's been a lot of effort at what we can do to encourage physical distancing. A fair number of people seem to be ignoring it entirely. That's not wise. We'll show you why in just a minute. There's lots of fogging going on um, with all kinds of things. Most of those things are kind of difficult. They're kind of toxic or they're caustic. And we'll get back to that in a moment. There was an effort at the UK to take an opposite effort that was unfolding in the United States and some other countries where everybody was trying to be protected. And the UK was going to do it in a staged fashion, let a herd immunity develop in those people who were under age 70, not at otherwise at risk, likely to have mild disease and begin building antibodies, begin building immunities. They gave that up yesterday and I'm gonna show you the chart on exactly why they did that. You may have also seen elder hour appearing. That's where a grocery store opens up in the morning, having disinfected itself thoroughly overnight, lets only people who are at risk into the store, the elderly, the immunocompromised, and those people get a chance to shop for an hour and check out and leave. Then there's a window of time where the store is again completely disinfected before the rest of the world is let in for the shopping that they need to do. That's being called elder hour, and I think it started in Australia. And there's fiddling, um, and I shouldn't have put that in there. That's kind of um, a, a, a bit snarky, um, but it's kind of what my country is doing. Um, and they're not trying to do it in most of the professional sectors, but much of what had been put into place had been dismantled, and many of the experts that I worked with in the White House for the Ebola outbreak in 2014 um, are now scattered about the place, and that makes things very inefficient. Next, please. So of those things that governments have done, um, we have some early results. Lockdowns definitely worked in China, but the cost was enormous. Testing is working. And as the WHO said, test, 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 test. We have to know the denominators. We can't talk about case fatality rates very readily. We can't talk about infection rates. We can't talk about waves that are coming on in a Gaussian distribution unless we know what the denominator is. So testing. Um, Philippines. Uh, part of the systems things we'll talk about in just a second is that the um, the restrictions, not exactly a quarantine, but the restrictions put around Manila happened to exclude a manufacturing plant that made the wiring harness for the Ford F-150. That shut down the Ford F-150 plant in Detroit for lack of that wiring harness. But that, it turns out, does not matter because earlier today, Ford and GM, General Motors, and Fiat Chrysler all said that they are shutting down production in North America. That just changed the employment picture in this nation. UK. The UK chose to advise people to avoid public events. But unfortunately, that means that people are choosing not to attend public events. If you're one of those people that has a place that hosts public events, that does nothing for your insurance. If the UK had said, we are shutting down all of these public events, then your insurance kicks in and you can survive. But otherwise, as the Repertory Theater um, in London said, 290,000 people are being thrown out of work and it's going to destroy the entertainment industry in Britain. Um, I don't know that that's true. I report what I've been reading, um, but it is different when somebody is advised not to go somewhere as against being legally um, mandated not to go there. Uh, the foggers particularly in South Korea, in Cambodia, in Taiwan. Um, it's a relatively small number of people who are doing a lot of this fogging. They're exhausted, they're exposed to the disinfectant, and by its very nature, they're kind of exposed to the virus. Um, it's hard work and they're getting tired. Um, sheltering in place. I live on a small island, not far from Seattle, and we have only a small number of businesses here. We have been asked by the governor here to do very, very little. Um, and so nobody's going to restaurants. The movie theater that ordinarily would have seen 150 people last Saturday night saw nine. And they sent out a note uh, to our Sunday paper that said, um, we understand completely why this is so, but our landlords are not modifying anything 
and our people are not getting paid. And if this keeps up by middle April, we will be bankrupt. And part of what we're talking about here on this island and is being talked about all over the world is what kind of society are we going to come back to if we do all of these protective measures, lose a large chunk of what makes us communities, the infection goes away, but things are still broken in a very big way. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, Marriott, United, Delta, all the things where people move around, those are, they're crashing. Um, Africa is still invisible. As of last night, uh, 463 cases had been identified across 54 countries. Uh, wow. And fiddling here in the United States is not proving very useful. Next. Now, what you should see here is a fairly complicated diagram um, that has green and red and dark blue and light blue and black. Um, this is a document that was mocked mercilessly, mercilessly when it was released back around 2010. Um, this was uh, done by PA Consulting Group for the coalition working in Afghanistan to describe um, just how complex the systems are that are influencing what that coalition force was trying to do. This was mocked just hugely, including in the New York Times, as just how nonsensical PowerPoint had become, how everybody's a PowerPoint ranger, and clearly we don't do know how to do war fighting, that's why we're losing the war, or whatever. Um, that, of course, is nonsense, right? You wouldn't blame PowerPoint for that diagram any more than you blame the piece of paper that that's written on. Um, that's a causal loop diagram. That's showing relationships. That's showing interdependencies. That's showing how one thing influences another. And it's incredibly important, and we don't know enough about it for this outbreak. So this is a strong advocate. Uh, I'm advocating that we do a great deal more systems level thinking associated with the interrelationships globally. Some of that is being done. Argonne National Laboratory is doing a particularly good job, but not much of that has been made public yet. It's not classified, it's just that they don't normally have a method for getting it out to the public. Same thing with Carnegie Mellon. And we'll talk about Carnegie Mellon in just a moment. So next. Getting out of what people are doing and back to the pandemic itself, um, looking at the systems associated, as we were just discussing, with the actual coronavirus, those first six items are pretty pure medicine, right? We talk about how you catch it, what you do to get it away from you, how you go back and find out how people got it in the first place, how you protect people from being able to catch this, and how severe they're likely to get based on how, their underlying health, their age, and so forth. We don't talk a lot about speed of recovery, although that's a getting better known now, but the last three are what I think are important. Performance while impaired. Ordinarily, we'd think about that, that when you're, when you're ill, you don't want to pay attention. It's hard for you to focus. You can't sleep well. You're tired. Things ache. You don't want to move. Your patience is short. Fair enough. Um, but in another sense, particularly when we are all working from home, your performance is impaired by the fact that you're not in your workplace. And what is that doing to productivity? We have good evidence that working from home is much more productive in many cases than working in an office. But that's not when you're also being a parent. It's not when you're also homeschooling. So having to be teacher and parent and employee is a little tough. And how's your performance when all that is going on? We're just beginning to measure that. The economic impact, of course, is enormous and the political vulnerability. There are um, a lot of discussions underway right now in academic centers and in working groups about how many governments are likely to fall as a consequence of what's unfolding here. A lot of that is in part, do, let's be careful about that, that phrasing. Some of that is due to the fact that there is a deliberate effort at disruption and division underway. Next, please. I'm going to go through just five of those 10, and I'm going to do it very quickly. Disinfection. A report just came out yesterday from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that was a compilation of a lot of studies that show these things. If you haven't already seen this data, let me give it to you here. SARS-CoV, which is the virus for COVID-19, lives in the air as a viral aerosol for three hours. You can detect it for four hours on copper. Copper is usually considered to be relatively disinfecting. That's good information on what's happening with copper. Cardboard, 24 hours. 
that got a lot of people wondering with, as they put it, a raised eyebrow about the mail, about a shipping manifest, about a box that is being shipped from someplace that might have had somebody positive. Um, and three days on plastic, stainless steel. And I just needed to put in there that colloidal silver solution, which is the reason New York State is suing a televangelist, um, it's not antiviral. As it happens, it is antibacterial, and there's good evidence for that, but it didn't do anything at all for the viruses. So if we know that about disinfection, here's the first thing that I'll show you that's practical. Um, this is, in full disclosure, a company where I'm a very, very, very minor shareholder. Here at Singularity, we get involved in all kinds of companies as incubators and as people who are advisors and so forth. Briotech is one of those. It's a new class of disinfectant. It is synthesized biomimicry. It takes white blood cell molecules from the myeloperoxidase pathway, and it reconstitutes that molecule by a brand new atomic method, atom by atom. Uh, uh, hydrogen, chlorine, uh, oxygen, and chlorine. Um, it is completely organic, it's non GMO, but what matters is it appears to be very effective at coronavirus, at least the OC43 version of coronavirus, which is the one that usually infects humans, gives people a cold. For example, you probably have a couple of varieties of coronavirus with you all the time, um, and they cause occasional mild illnesses. This one that we're working with right now, which is uh, SARS-CoV-2, we've never seen before, but most others we have. And LRV is a log reduction value of 5.3. That's how many nines. So 99.999 eradication, and it's safe enough to spray in your eyes. I've got some right here. Um, and if I take it and spray it in my eyes and my mouth and my, now I'm all damp, um, it's very, very, very safe and has an EPA certification. And I've never had to dry myself off in public before in quite such a way. Um, and it's being used in Shanghai. Uh, China knows about this stuff. And it requested pallets uh, way back when. Um, and South Korea is now evaluating it because it's entirely possible that because of where it comes from, it may be interrupting one of the inflammatory cascades, the interleukin-6 cascade, um, and may be able to reduce, if inhaled, the acute respiratory distress syndrome that we're seeing kill people in this. Um, it has been requested by multiple nations. It does not have an FDA here in the United States. It has only an EPA. So I would not advocate that you use it as a human being. Um, as in the United States, the EPA does things, the FDA does people. So what other nations choose to do is their business. Moving on. Contact tracing. Very, very difficult problem. And this is a fascinating diagram. If you look at patient number one, number 31 in South Korea, you see that he started um, at a club, and then he went to church, and then he went elsewhere, and then he went back to church, and then he got a fever, and then he went back to church again, and eventually he went to a clinic, was diagnosed, and shifted to a center for coronavirus patients. In the meantime, some poor schmucks had to track down everybody he saw. 1,160 contacts to make sure that they arrested the spread of what he was able to um, shed. So that's really tough. Let's go to the next slide. There are at least two efforts that I know about that are able to do some contact tracing that are available in ways that had not been so until recently. One is a new effort from MIT uh, with the Mayo Clinic and Harvard called Safe Paths. And you can read what it says there, global scale COVID-19 private tracker without a surveillance state for individuals and health authorities, mathematically enforced privacy of personal data. There's a link down there, but if you go to Safe Paths Private Kit, you'll see it come up. The other one is from Instead, which is the TED Prize that I used to run. They do only free and open source stuff. So there's absolutely no value to me in showing this to you personally to you, except to give you good stuff. They have something called active contact tracing that they did with MSF during the Ebola outbreak. And it is still free, it is still open source. And you can go take a look at it at instead.org if you are somebody who needs to know something about contact tracing. Susceptibility. Um, we just learned yesterday that there's a monoclonal antibody that seems to block 
SARS-CoV-2 from binding to human epithelial cells. That's extremely promising because that's one of the things that would be very good to be able to do. Just make it not possible for you to catch the virus despite having an adequate viral load that would normally lead to an infection. Um, and the second of those, sorry, the next of, uh, I should tell you, the next, um, where we're talking about Amory, right? And some dark turquoise le lettering and a Chinese character. Um, go back and listen to Amory Levins. Amory talked on Monday um, and he talked about how to flatten the curve without the things that you normally uh, would hear from the CDC or from WHO. It is possible to reinforce your immune system with some pretty straightforward things that you would not think are important but turn out to be really meaningful. You'd be surprised at how important seven hours of solid sleep every night can be for boosting your immune system. And we have great numbers on this, excellent research. Sleep every night. Hydration. Um, it turns out that it's much easier for uh, viruses to bind to dry um, tracheal tissue than to moist. So stay hydrated. Nutritious food, regular exercise, alcohol, toxins, and of course, your mental well-being. When people are thrown together in a semi-quarantined quarantined environment where everybody's working from home and nobody's able to go to school or work, um, it is good to be able to break free of the things that are weighing on you and do something that's kind of fun together. There's a few things, playing an instrument, meditation, board games, puzzles with those you love. You know, remind each other that you're actually in this together. And yes, your days are complicated and they're unusual and you're not able to do the things you'd normally like to do, but please. And also let me put another foot stomping against the podium for vitamin C. Amory's information is rock solid. I have been through all of the references that he gave. I am a doctor. He's very quick to tell you that he is not. The numbers, the studies, the opinions that have been published are as he says. And I personally have begun taking large doses, gram plus doses of vitamin C, L-ascorbic acid. Next, please. Number eight, the economic impact. Um, late yesterday in a congressional testimony here in the United States, um, Mnuchin um, said that there might be as much as 20% U.S. unemployment by late summer. <clears throat> Back in the Depression, we had an unemployment rate uh, here in the United States in the 1930s. We had an unemployment rate of about 24%. That is much higher than we had during the recession in 2008 and is a societal transformation. We have already seen what's happening to the global airline industry. What might not be so visible is the global shipping industry for the past month. I've been following the Shanghai Shipping Index, and a fair number of ships have left port with 10% of their expected cargo. That's um, not manageable, right? These are companies that work on relatively thin margins. They work on cash flow. They work on immediate revenue, and they haven't had the cash flow. They don't have the revenue. They have to pay for the ships. They have to pay for the crews. Um, they have all kinds of port fees that have to be paid, offload dock workers, longshoremen, and it's not there. Um, something that we have, might be missing is what it's going to take to restart the global supply chain. China's factories are idle because there has been a significant reduction globally in who's buying stuff, with the exception, of course, of things that are happening on Amazon. But for the restaurants and the small stores, there are lots of things that are not getting the consumers that they would have expected. And so um, the things that have happened to China may become exacerbated by that. Um, US and EU retail are unfilled. Um, I sit on a group uh, of disaster responders, and one of them just a couple of days ago said that they were told by a local um, big box store in their area near Los Angeles that they did not expect to be able to refill their shelves in this coming week. Um, I don't know why that should be. That's not an area that's particularly affected, but apparently the supply chain process is that broken already. Africa will eventually become visible as we get testing and we begin to see how widespread that is. Um, we've already seen what's happened in other locations where people gather. Um, Iran is badly hurt and there may be repercussions in all of the places where Iran and um, Saudi Arabia um, and Russia and the United States are contesting for geopolitical um, importance. 
And of course, China, not surprisingly, is positioning itself as having been very competent. They got their efforts under control, uh, coordinated, and their viral outbreak under control. Um, they are making donations of all kinds of important things that they managed to stockpile because they no longer need them as much. And they're arguing that their government governance model is more effective than some of the other governance models that are having struggles dealing with this. I think that's a, a valid perspective um, and will be tough to counter for those who wish to counter it. Next, please. Economic impact of the graph. You should see the graph here that is what caused Boris Johnson to shift the policy yesterday in the United Kingdom for how they intended to manage the uh, sweep of this pandemic through the UK. Um, this is a part of a 22 page brief. I'm happy to supply it to anybody who'd like to have it, but it's freely available online now. Um, that came out of Neil Ferguson's group um, at Imperial College. And you see the reference up in the upper right impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce COVID-19 mortality and healthcare demand. Um, this shows that if you do nothing, the black line that is very, very high um, is the result. And if you do everything you possibly can, the blue line at the bottom is um, the likely result. But what you're looking at is the red line that goes flat across the bottom. That is the number of ICU beds in the UK. So very quickly, you exceed the capacity for critical care. And I'm a critical care doc. I'm an intensive uh, care doc. I ran in the intensive care unit for years. I know what this means. Um, it is clear that no matter what they do, they are going to have a crushing blow happen against their critical care system um, in early summer. Um, they're going to try to minimize that damage, try to do everything they can between now and then to prepare for that onslaught, but it's going to be tough. But that's why they shifted away. The other graphs um, are elaborations on this, and you, I recommend reading that 20-page document. It's very accessible, and it changed the minds of Parliament. Next, please. And this should be a blue diagram on a, black, a blue network diagram on a black background. This is Kathleen Carley's work at Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie Mellon is phenomenal. Kathleen's lab in particular is phenomenal at information operations analysis. They have done it for elections in the US. They have done it for information operations out of Russia, China, North Korea, Ukraine, um, they looked at the Yellow Vest movement. They looked at the Macron election. This is the Canadian election last summer. And the thing I want you to notice, and it may be difficult for you to see, depending what kind of screen you're on, is the red dots that permeate that blue diagram. Everywhere you see a red dot, that's a bot. That's a link to somebody who's on a social media feed that is not human. And if you have a chance to explore that closely, there's a lot. We are seeing exactly the same kind of diagram. And she tried to get, unfortunately you have to run these over time and she didn't have time to get me one for COVID-19, but she tells me that for what she can see, it's very similar. She's supported by Rebecca Goolsby. Dr. Rebecca Goolsby is at the US Office of Naval Research. She supports this work on information operations at Carnegie Mellon University. They are watching what's happening in the divisive messaging and the distracting misinformation that is being put out about COVID-19. You might remember that a month ago, WHO said that they were not only working with what was shaping into a pandemic from an infectious disease perspective, but also an infodemic as people began to spread bad information, sometimes deliberately, sometimes just because they're gullible or they don't have access to good information. But this is a time to trust the experts. This is a time to trust CDC. This is a time to trust the NIH and Tony Fauci and WHO and the other institutions who've made professional careers out of this. They're very competent. They've been through this multiple times and the messaging ought to be coming directly from those experts. So we're seeing all those classes of bots that you see there, Amplifier and Cyborg and Chaos. These are bots that are specifically designed to do those jobs, breaking us in our coherent response to COVID-19. Um, don't let that happen. Let's go to the next slide. 
and I'd be happy to take questions over the next while. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eric. I think that went pretty smooth for the uh, the remote chat operator here, or the remote slide operator. Good work. It helps if I actually tell you what to do, but, uh, but thank you for being patient with all of that. You know, it ended up working out well because I could hear your uh, keyboard clicking, and I just tried to mirror that. <laughs> that works. That works for me. Yeah. Good. Um, so everybody who's asked, yes, we will. Um, assuming we get Eric's permission, we will share out these slides with. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm giving all. free permission right here in public. You can have those slides. I will also send you all the documents that I referenced happily. Wonderful, and we will get those up on our resources page at su.org. Slash and COVID nineteen. Let me go a little beyond that because most of those things I did not reference. I had statements out there that were just hanging in midair, and you have to trust me on them. No, you don't. Um, I will give you the primary documents that led to each of those things that I was telling you about. Awesome, you're the man. I would expect nothing less. All right, let's see what kind of questions we have in here, um, yeah. and go from there. Um, okay, one that got upvoted the most was about an article that once you get infected, you can't get infected twice. What do you know about this? Active discussion, um, hugely active discussion, because it's very important. Um, a coronavirus is a coronavirus is a coronavirus, right? We expect them to behave in a certain way. And we know coronaviruses, right? We understand how they behave. We've been around them for forever. Um, and most coronaviruses we've ever seen, remember, we've never seen this one before, but most coronaviruses we've ever seen behave in the same way. You get an immunological response. If you check the serology, you find that you've got antibodies. If you've got antibodies, that means when your body sees it again, you'll be protected. Now, as you know, with influenza, for example, we have two different sites that are highly variable, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, H and N. So when you hear about H5N1 or H1N1 or H7N9 or H7N6, those are individual strains of an influenza virus. And as long as those numbers are different, you may be able to get infected with that new strain. Yes, they're all influenza, but they're kind of sort of different immunologically. Same thing here. Coronavirus OC43 will not protect you against SARS, will not protect you against MERS-CoV, will not protect you against uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19 coronavirus we're seeing now. But once you get COVID-19, once you get SARS-CoV-2, this current coronavirus, it's very confusing to have to refer to it by multiple things. Um, but COVID-19 is the disease process. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. Coronavirus is what we're all calling it because when you look at it on an electron microscopy, it has all of these cool little spikes around it that make it look like a crown. That's why it's called a coronavirus. Enough of that. Um, the um, So if you see this coronavirus and you get infected, your body is going to treat it like any other foreign pathogen, pathogen, generate antibodies, and you'll be able to find those antibodies in the bloodstream if you look for it later. That's important information. It means you've had it. You should be immune. If it behaves like every other thing that we've seen like this, you should be immune. Unfortunately, since we've never seen it before, and we've only seen this infection since about November, um, the first cases appeared recognizably in late December, but genetically we've tracked it back to probably mid to late November. Um, this ought to be something you get once and then you're safe, which is why I said on that uh, susceptibility slide, if you keep your immune system robust, like Amy Levins told you to, you should listen to him. Uh, I'm your doctor, you should listen to Amy Levins. Um, then you're likely to get a milder illness, you'll recover more quickly, you'll have a good antibody response from your healthy immune system, and you'll go back to work immune, which means you also can't give it to other people once you've stopped the shedding period. Now, all of this is unfolding, right? We're all doing our very best to understand this in real time. And we have people asking a hell of a lot of questions that we cannot yet answer, but we're trying. I promise a whole bunch of very smart, very passionate people are not sleeping so we can get to the answers to this. God, that was a long answer. Yeah. The worthwhile <laughs> one, nonetheless. All right, let's go. Uh, let's talk about detection a little bit here. So Manette asks, uh, testing everywhere is helping. Um, however, we're really only testing people with symptoms. Uh, is there is there anything that we can do to test or detect this before people have symptoms yet? Um, apparently, yes, because there's really good evidence that we shed before we're symptomatic. Some people do. 
We don't know why them and not others. Um, but again, we're sorting all this out in real time. So it ought to be possible to detect people who are not symptomatic, but who are infected by the virus that they're shedding. Now, where do we get that virus from? At the moment, we're doing nasal swabs um, most of the time. You can also do throat swabs and you can do other things, um, tracheal aspirates and, and lung aspirates and, and other things as well. Um, but right now we're sticking a Q-tip in your nose. And by the way, it has to have a plastic stem. It cannot have a wooden stem. It turns out the wood reacts in an interesting way with the reagents. It took us a little time to discover that too. So it has to be only a plastic swab. <laughs> So um, we stick it in your nose. Um, it's very uncomfortable. We get it thoroughly saturated. We do things to it in reagents and we get a positive or negative response. Um, if you are shedding, if you're in that window between getting infected and getting symptomatic, then we ought to be able to pick it up. But again, that's kind of dependent upon how rapidly that virus is replicating. And if it's not showing up in your secretions because there's just not enough viral, viral particles, then maybe we'll miss it. Or maybe we'll get a half an answer. Do we count half an answer? Well, maybe. If you listen to Lori Garrett, and you should, um, Lori's at the Council on Foreign Relations, and she wrote a book called The Coming Plague about a quarter century ago that is absolutely fantastic. And she was spot on then, and she's spot on now. And she's getting interviewed all over the place. And one of the things she's drawing a distinction on is whether we need a, a, a detection test or a diagnostic test. So one something that says, oh, very probably, or somebody says, yeah, by God, you're going into quarantine. Those are those are slightly different. You can afford to be warning, you know, having a screening test that says, yeah, probably. So people know to be cautious, know to not hang around their 81-year-old mother because their 81-year-old mother will not handle the illness as well as they do. Um, and as it happens, I've got somebody around me just now um, who uh, came back from a trip to Europe and went to visit their relatives, didn't realize, and um, infected their 65-year-old sister and, as I just said, 81-year-old mother. Not a member of my family, it's somebody on the East Coast, but um, the guilt associated with that is mm. apparently pretty heavy. That person was in tears on what they had done, infecting their mother and their dangerously compromised sister when she herself had not had any idea. She had even been exposed so there's an example of maybe shedding before symptomatic. And by the way, she's very symptomatic now. She definitely has coronavirus. Mm, so interesting and unfortunate. Mm. Um, I think mm. we might have time for one, one maybe two. A uh, quick one here. What dose of vitamin C are you taking? Are there any lots. supplements you'd recommend? Lots, 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 lots. Um, no, uh, I would go to Amory's uh, deck because he's got the science. So uh, those of you who don't know who Amory Lovins is um, or didn't know that you should have watched his presentation, you can go onto Wikipedia and look him up. Um, he uh, He's bright um, and he's very, very careful. Um, and what he's recommending is probably what I would recommend. Um, in my case, I'm taking multiple grams a day. I'm not religious about it because the stuff is edible and it's kind of tasty. So I genuinely take it like candy um, to, as they say, um, symptom limits. That means until the diarrhea starts, okay? Then you back off by two grams. <laughs> the things I say, uh, I'm yes. with, right, we're, we're right here in front of thousands of friends. That's right. Exactly. I mean, you got you got to know when to stop. It's it's always a good sign. <laughs> right. It's you, it's you and me, Adam, and, and a couple of other people listening. Got it. Just a couple other folks. Um, okay. La last one, and then your your closing thoughts. Do you anticipate this coronavirus to mutate? Oh, it already has. Yeah, we know that. So there are people that do really good genetic analyses as things unfold. And as the samples come in, the, uh, you know, a subset of them go off to people who do that particular kind of thing. And we're already watching um, variations um, in the genetics. There are people actually that I would talk to um, on Singularity faculty as a part of this um, this webinar that know a lot more about that subject than I do. But we've already talked, at least in the in the WHO meetings I've been in, we've already talked about um, SARS-CoV-2A and SARS-CoV-2B. So um, one has characteristics of high lethality, low transmissibility. The other is high transmissibility, low lethality. So you can get it, but it won't kill you. Or you might not get it, but if you do get it, it'll kill you. Um, those are 
a little bit hyperbolic. Don't take that too seriously. But there do seem to be mutations that are separating out as, frankly, coronavirus discovers us, right? We are a host. We're a new host. It made the leap from animal to human only very, very recently. It replicates very quickly, but it's figuring out how to live with us more effectively. And it's always a bad idea to kill the horse you're riding on. So um, if a virus needs a host to replicate within, it probably needs to modify its characteristics in order to ensure longevity and replication. Yeah, appreciate that. All right, any parting thoughts for our group? Um, no, but a bit to singularity. Thank you for holding this. I've been able to touch in over the past couple of days, learned a ton of stuff I did not know, met some people I hadn't met before, and learned about the remarkable number of active intelligences that hang out in the chat room, not just on the screen. Smart people are attending this. Thanks, I, Adam. I could not agree more. Thank you for uh, giving us some of your time. We know you're a busy guy, but appreciate you being here today. A pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Talk to you soon. All right. Well, that was an update from Dr. Eric Rasmussen. Uh, I can tell looking at the chat that everybody is uh, very, very appreciative of uh, all that great content. So we'll make sure that we get that deck. And of course, it will be at su.org uh, forward slash COVID-19. So coming up next... We are going to be talking with Chip Norcross and Paul D. Roberts um, about business strategies that are resilient to the threat of disruption um, caused by global challenges. So we'll go once again, we're going to zoom out a little bit. Um, COVID-19 certainly inspired this, but we'll take a step back um, and look at those. Um, I've got a couple, couple updates just to share before we move on to that next session. Let me do this. All right, getting a little bit faster. Here we go. Uh, so those resources, in case you missed them, I'm sure somebody will uh, will post them in the chat here shortly. But join the Facebook group, uh, share your ideas. Uh, next session, I've got a poll for you guys um, about some future content ideas that we uh, that you might be able to help us with, so we can create some great content for you. Video recordings, if you're looking for closed captioning, subtitles, what have you, we're getting them uploaded to YouTube as fast as possible. And then of course, any resources, slides, links, research that gets gets mentioned, we're putting it on the resource page over there and to the right. We've got another um, virtual conference coming up in partnership with EXO and XPRIZE. Uh, check that out at exoworld.live slash SU and that's capital SU uh, to get that. We've got a corporate innovation podcast coming out. So for those of you that are uh, in the corporate world, Generally, and in innovation specifically, check it out. We've partnered up with uh, Chris Ostergaard and our, our friends in SU in the Nordics uh, to make this one happen. You can get early access to the first couple episodes at that link down there at the bottom. And uh, before this started, I put a, put a call to action out there for anybody that had something interesting going on, uh, solutions they were iter iterating, and I promised that I'd share it here. So I uh, wanted to run through a couple of these. These are by no means... Uh, endorsed by Singularity University, but I thought it was a cool way to, to crowdsource some stuff. So we've got the um, NURX app. Um, they're introducing working on some home testing and online consultations, similar to, similarly to what the Everly Well team was doing. Um, also, go and check out the folks over at Nth Opinion. Uh, they built a tool to connect global partners uh, who are on the front lines. So they can share real-time, reliable, and critical answers with each other. This stems from Onisio Leal's presentation. Um, you know, I think is a good good app to go and try out. Uh, we've got Rise Science coming in. Uh, they are doing some really awesome stuff with helping you sleep. And as Eric and Amory and many others have continued to reiterate, get sleep. It's so, so important uh, for our immune systems and for us staying healthy. So if you're looking to get uh, some help with better sleep, check out Rise. Um, they've got a mobile app. It's killer. Um, some other stuff that has come in along the way. I've uh, got some ideas of stuff that people would like to do. Um, Resurgo is doing um, some nCRNA analysis, and it looks like they are developing the open source of the genome um, to maybe help others kind of iterate on solutions faster. 
and then Keith has come up with covidreport.net, uh, where he's trying to aggregate news that's going out about it. And then, of course, we actually connected with Everly Well and had them on the first day. So thanks for coming. And then ncoronavirus.org. Looks like they're putting together an action network of scientists and volunteers. Um, so if you're interested in contributing to that, go for it. Um, and if you've got others, tweet at me. Um, we'll, we'll continue to, to publish these and share along the way. But that is it for this session. And we will see you here in a couple of minutes.